Ready? Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Inez Barron, and I am the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Today we are conducting an oversight hearing on child care centers at CUNY, City University of New York, CUNY, and we are holding this hearing jointly with the Committee on Women, chaired by my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. Witnesses invited to uh, testify include representatives from the CUNY administration, directors of CUNY child care centers, children and women's advocacy organizations, student organizations, and other interested parties. We last held a hearing on this topic well over a year ago, and at that time we recognized how student parents struggle to balance parenting and school, often to the detriment of their schooling. It takes them longer to complete their studies, they may not perform as well academically, and they frequently drop out of school altogether. But parenting students should not have to choose between caring for their families and going to school. The whole point of obtaining a college education for most parents is to improve the quality of life for their children. A college education leads to better jobs and higher pay. It can make the difference between a job that pays health benefits for your family and one that does not. It can also lead to better outcomes for their children. Changing demographics in higher education, higher education enrollment, demonstrate an imperative need to provide reliable, affordable, and quality child care services to parenting students. More than half of college students nationwide are female, and an even higher percentage of female students to males is projected over the ensuing years. Students nationwide are also increasingly older, suggesting that parent stu parenting students may become more ubiquitous across college campuses nationally rather than just an anomaly or an aberration, otherwise known as a quote, non-traditional student. CUNY is a special place that embraces so many so-called non-traditional students, and I applaud their efforts that offer childcare services to parenting students. One particular program at City University was founded by Black Studies Professor Geraldine Price. Mama Green, as she was affectionately called, had previously founded, quote, as a twig is bent, an African-centered daycare center affiliated with Lehman College in the Bronx in the early 1970s. She went on to found the center at City University, City College, where she remained until the early 1990s. So I want to pay special recognition to Mama Jerry and celebrate her for her achievements in this important issue. Additionally, there were 16 slots that were originally opened to the community. The college, at the discretion of the Chancellor Ann Reynolds, forced the center to allocate these slots to student parents. They claimed that there was a need, however, the real reason for the change was as a result of student protests against tuition increases. Students were able to obtain a lot of support from the surrounding community based on the relationships of parents in the community with those with children who were enrolled at the center. And I want to recognize uh, my CUNY liaison, Indigo Washington, who was one of those parents who organized students while her daughter was at LaGuardia and she was scheduled to enroll during the fall. So there are many parents who are very vocal in challenging the administration. But today, CUNY can do better, and we are here to help you understand how to succeed. When we last received testimony in February 2017, the Child Development and Family Services Center at City College, the one founded by Mama Jerry, had been closed since 2015. The college promised the renovations would be completed within one year. And here we are, three years later, and that center remains closed. And in fact, if you go to the center's website, you're greeted with a picture of children, presum presumably those of the children there, who are happy to play, but nonetheless referenced by a sterile caption in all caps, closed for renovation. That is unacceptable. There are New Yorkers that need these services, who want these services, and would like to know how they can rely on them. Yet there remains no forwarding address 
phone number, or listing of alternative resources a parenting student could seek. And although CUNY's five-year capital plan speaks of the City College's child care centers reopening in the fall of 2018, the lack of information on its website suggests a larger systemic issue and begs the community to ask, what is CUNY doing to make sure that parenting students know how and where to go to seek services? And I, too, wonder how many parenting students have since dropped out of school or had their education delayed by the closure of the center at City College. We intend to explore these and other questions today. But before I turn the mic over to my esteemed colleague, Helen Rose, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who are present, and that is Councilmember, Councilmember Holden. And I would also like to uh, thank my legislative director in Washington, my chief of staff, Joy Simmons, the committee's finance analyst, Elizabeth Hoffman, and this is her first session with us, our policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, and our committee counsel, Paul Senegal. And at this time, we'll hear from my colleague, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women. Thank you, Chair Barron. Councilmember Barron has been a leader and an advocate on CUNY, for CUNY students for so long. Her passion and commitment is unrivaled, and I am honored to have a chance to work with her. CUNY is a treasure. It is a world-class institution with colleges throughout the five boroughs, and just as critically, it has historically been an affordable and accessible option for New Yorkers. The CUNY Child Care Centers are an integral component of that affordability and accessibility. According to CUNY, these centers serve over 1,600 student parents and 2,400 of their children. This support can, provide, can prove critical. A 2016 survey of student parents served by the centers found that 60% reported they would not have been able to complete college without them. But too many parents and too many families are unable to access this affordable child care. For many student parents, especially those on waiting lists or maybe unaware of the resources available to them, this represents a real barrier to higher education, especially for women who often serve as the primary caregivers. And as my colleague, Chair Barron, pointed out, Child, child care remains an issue we cannot afford to ignore. This need for affordable child care is not only felt by students, but it's also felt by CUNY faculty and staff, and indeed the communities in which they operate. As much as the status quo is a challenge for students, it is also a challenge for the workers at the daycare centers. While child care centers operate under the same academic calendar and curriculum as public schools, a recent report by the public advocate found that the average salary for teachers in CUNY child care centers is roughly $38,000 compared to a starting salary of approximately $50,000 at the Department of Education. This disparity makes solving the challenge at CUNY's child care centers that much more difficult. It is also reflective of the broader need to ensure fair compensation for all workers in the historically and predominantly female human services sector. These two issues are of a piece, making it possible for caregivers to attend CUNY and ensuring that caregivers CUNY are properly compensated. Fundamentally, both are about the ability of caregivers to participate fully in this city and in this society. There are institutional challenges to achieving this vision at CUNY, and we will explore some of them at our joint hearing today, as these committees have in the past. But 
we are here because these challenges can and must be overcome. Later today, this city council will put its money where our mouth is when we vote to allocate an additional $600,000 to support child care centers at CUNY for fiscal year 2019 coming up. Un obtained under the leadership of Speaker Johnson and Chair Barron, this funding can potentially be used to support expanded enrollment capacity, extended hours, additional teachers' materials, or equipment for ch children's activities. But this is only the start, and a much more long-term approach and commitment is still needed. I look forward to following the lead of Chair Barron and working with my colleagues and all the stakeholders in this room and elsewhere to ensure that we follow through. I also want to thank all the staff who made this hearing possible, including the Committee on Women's Council, Brenda McKinney, Policy Analyst, Chloe Rivera, who we share, Legal Fellow, Rabia Kasim, intern Jessica Ting, as well as my legislative director, Sean Fitzpatrick, and our legislative interns, Anisha Ayub and Rob ben, uh, Bentlieski, for their work in preparing for this hearing. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Chair Barron. Oh, and also I'd like to give a shout out not here right now, but to our financial analyst, Daniel Krupp. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. And with that, I'm going to ask that the first panel come up, and those panel participants are Mikhail Kim, Policy Associate, uh, representing Public Advocate Letitia James. Christopher Rosa, the Interim Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs at CUNY. Keisha Vaughan, University Manager of Child Care and Leadership Programs at CUNY. Cecilia Scott Croft, Director of BMCC Early Childhood Center at CUNY. And Maria Hernandez, a student from Bronx Community College. If those persons would come forward. I'm going to ask the council to administer the affirmation. Good morning. Uh, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Please uh, state your names for the record. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Christopher Rosa, Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at CUNY. Good morning. I'm Keisha Vaughn, University Manager of Child Care Leadership at CUNY. Michelle Kim, Policy Associate for the New York City Public Advocate, Letitia James. Good morning, my name is Maria Hernandez and I'm a student at BCC. Good morning, I'm Cecilia Scott Croft and I'm the Executive Director of Borough Manhattan Community College's Early Childhood Center. Thank you. We're going to begin with Ms. Kim representing the public advocate, and then we will continue with the CUNY panel in the order which they would prefer. So Ms. Kim. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Kim, Policy Associate for the New York City Public Advocate, Letitia James, and I'm here today to present testimony on the public advocate James's behalf. We would like to thank uh, the chairs, Council Member Barron and Rosenthal, as well as their staff and the committee staff for holding this oversight hearing on the critical issue of childcare at CUNY. I would also like to personally thank them for allowing me to read the public advocate's testimony into the record. No parents should have to choose between their family and going to school or work, but unfortunately, the staggering cost of childcare keep too many New Yorkers trapped in poverty. The Office of the Public Advocate has released three reports on childcare issues during her term, two of which specifically address the childcare needs at CUNY schools. We paid particular attention to CUNY 
because we believe that providing adequate on-site childcare would open doors to college education for parents, especially moms who wouldn't otherwise have the resources to advance their education. In 2015, our first childcare report, Relieving the Third Shift, called on the city to increase its long stagnant <coughs> investment in CUNY childcare, which had remained just $500,000 since 1980. We were incredibly excited to learn that this year the, count, the city council with the chair's leadership was able to negotiate a significant increase in funding. Since the release of the first CUNY Child Care Report, the Office of the Public Advocate met with directors of CUNY Child Care Centers as well as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, which manages the child care centers to further investigate the underlying challenges of serving all student parents at CUNY. In addition to the funding increase, we learned more broadly that CUNY child care infrastructure needed to be strengthened, which the second report addresses. The missing piece, strengthening CUNY's child care infrastructure, released in January 2018, makes recommendations to improve the effectiveness and sustainability of CUNY's existing child care system. Notably, the report found that there is a significant need for better, more centralized coordination and oversight over what is currently a diffuse system. The 16 child care centers that currently exist in CUNY all operate independently in terms of licensing, staffing, procurement, and even funding as a result of a 1983 New York State law. This means that each of the CUNY child care centers are applying and competing against each other for some of the same federal grants, undermining the collective success of the system as a whole. This decentralized system also causes significant cost inefficiencies, especially when it comes to staff benefits. Our report shows that three different centers are currently paying different rates for health insurance for their employees. For these reasons, the public advocate called for the creation of a dedicated office with CUNY, within CUNY focused on childcare to facilitate collaboration across CUNY's childcare centers and minimize the competitive atmosphere over funding. Our report also found that better data is needed in order to identify gaps in services and better tailor services to meet the needs of CUNY students. Finally, the report recommends significant increasing the number of slots for infants and toddlers. In New York City, the gap between the need for care and the availability of subsidized services is most acute for infants and toddlers. But only six out of 16 campus child care centers offer programs for this underserved and high need age group. It is critical that CUNY addresses the high demand for children under two so that student parents can continue pursuing their education without interruption. Childcare should no longer be considered a supplemental or add-on component of higher education, but a core component of students' academic success. Investing in CUNY childcare is not only the right thing to do, it is a common sense investment in our city's economic future. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. We look forward to hearing more about plans to finally tackle these critical issues. Thank you, Chair Barron, Chair Rosenthal, and Michelle, thank you uh, to you and your team from the Public Advocate's Office for your efforts to raise awareness of the importance of uh, child care to opportunities and access for CUNY students. Good morning, uh, my name is Chris Rosa, and I'm proud to serve as the Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at CUNY. Uh, Chair Barron and Chair Rosenthal, thank you for this opportunity to testify um, and to address the City Council on the very important issue of child care services at CUNY. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Keisha Fuentes, the University Manager of Child Care and Leadership Programs at CUNY, who is really our university's uh, content experts when it comes to campus child care, and she'll be here to engage richly with you in a conversation about the dimensions of our, of our child care programs at CUNY. Um, Cecilia Scott Croft, the Director of Early 
Childhood Center at Borough of Manhattan Community College and a real national leader in higher ed child care services. And Maria Hernandez, a student at Bronx Community College who has graciously offered to represent um, CUNY student parents in place of Ardeth Hutchins. Thanks to all of you, there has never been a more joyful day to discuss CUNY campus child care. There's never been a day of greater affirmation of the important work of our dedicated CUNY child care professionals and the CUNY families they serve. Because today, we know that the adopted 2019 city budget includes a $600,000 increase for CUNY campus child care. This increase more than doubles the city's investment in campus child care at CUNY and promises to expand access to higher education for New York City's parents. Um, member Combo, Chair Barron, and distinguished members of the Higher Education and Women's Committees, we know that this victory could not have been achieved without your staunch leadership. We thank you for being champions for CUNY student parents. On behalf of the university, I'd like to thank you for elevating access to campus child care as a critical resource for student parents. I also extend our deepest appreciation for this financial support that this body has year after year dedicated to CUNY campus child care centers. We know that access to on-campus child care is an essential component of student success. And furthermore, we know that high quality campus child care has a positive impact on the cognitive, social, and physical development of young children. Campus child care is an especially important resource for single and low income student parents. CUNY has long been a national leader in the provision of on-campus child care services. We continue to operate 16 campus child care centers at a time when the percentage of on-campus child care centers is declining nationally. According to the Institute for Women Policy Research, campus child care centers have been closing across the country. In 2015, less than half of four-year public colleges provided campus child care, down from 55% a decade ago. And during the same period of time, community colleges reported that campus child care declined at an even greater rate, from 53% down to 44%. During the 2017-2018 academic year, CUNY child care centers have served almost 1,500 children and 1,400 student parents. All CUNY child care centers enroll preschool children ages three to five years of age. Four centers offer both infant and toddler programs for children ages six months to three years of age. And two centers provide services uh, for toddlers ages 18 months to three years. Ten centers offer after school programs for school age children ages five to, 20, uh, to 12 years of age. The centers accommodate the needs of parents with some centers opening as early as 7 a.m. and closing at 9 p.m. and some are open on weekends. CUNY's Board of Trustees Campus Child Care Policy gives first priority for campus child care services to matriculating CUNY student parents, then provided the need for child care services by registered matriculated college students is being met, and to the extent that space and funding permit, priority goes to non-matriculated part-time college students. Then, to the extent that space and funding permit, the Board of Trustees policy allows CUNY faculty and staff to use the campus child care centers. Fees charged to faculty and staff children are set at market rates. Finally, to the extent that space and funding permit, the Board of Trustees policy states that a child care center operating on a CUNY college campus may also provide child care services to community members where the charges are set at prevailing market rates. Um, CUNY child care centers promote the success of student parents by providing subsidies for low-income student parents through funding from the New York State Child Care and Development Fund administered by OCFS and contracting with the New York City Department of Education to offer UPK at all 16 on-campus centers. Currently, three campuses are receiving C campus grants, a competitive federal grant that supports the participation of low-income parents in post-secondary education through the provision of campus-based child care. The university child care programs provide a broad range of developmental experiences for children, 
all of which feature parental involvement as a key program element and a core value. These programs provide an array of services that include parenting workshops, parent-teacher conferences, early intervention and prevention services, and health and wellness referrals. <coughs> Excuse me. Children at the centers are engaged in high-quality programs, the curricula reflecting the essential elements of quality program standards by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. These programs are thoroughly planned, challenging, and engaged, and culturally and linguistically responsive to the families that they serve. Experienced and dedicated early childhood educators plan activities and experiences based on curriculum goals and develop multicultural classroom settings that truly value diversity, leveraging it as a strength in learning. The centers also serve as a key resource to many academic departments by providing a venue for student internships, field work, and research. It is truly a rich setting for experiential learning for our CUNY students. The safety and wellness of the children we serve is paramount. Every campus child care center is licensed by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in compliance with New York City Health Code, which provides regulations for staff qualifications, staff-child ratios, program safety, emergency procedures, and facilities maintenance. We're proud to report that CUNY's child care centers have distinguished themselves through their excellence. Indeed, several centers have achieved national accreditation, meeting the professional standards of the high quality early care and education programs developed by the National Association for the Education of Young Children. CUNY 16 on-campus child care programs are making a critical difference in the lives of student parents and their families. In a 2014-15 CUNY survey of student parents using on-campus child care, more than eight out of 10 students said that they had more time to study and over six out of 10 said that they were able to take additional courses. The research shows that taking additional courses each semester has a positive effect on retention, academic momentum, and graduation. Despite our accomplishments and national recognition, we know that with sufficient resources, CUNY can do more for our student parents. Not all student parents need or want on-campus child care. They've made arrangements with family members or centers near their homes. However, still we know that currently we are not able to provide services to all of the student parents who want campus child care. Simply put, need exceeds capacity. To provide us with the tools that we need to measure the need and capture the experiences of our student parents, we're proud to inform you that we've formed a data group that is designing a system for collecting and reporting this information. The data we collect from student parents at the campuses will provide us with the ability to understand the quantity, need, access, and usage in detail and get a better sense of our unmet need and the need to develop our capacity. Many of our schools have reached capacity and can't offer additional slots. In order to serve more children and student parents, we simply need more space. We need to produce an assessment of current capacity by school and learn more about options. In closing, uh, we thank the council for its continued leadership on this key issue. We deeply appreciate your commitment to campus child care. Your advocacy drives city investments in CUNY campus child care to enable our centers to recruit and retain talented, qualified, and experienced early childhood educators to ensure that these teachers receive ongoing training and professional development, to allow our centers to remain open during the times when our students need them most, and to provide our colleges the resources for facilities maintenance and management to ensure that our centers are safe, clean, and welcoming to student parents and their children. I once again would like to take this opportunity to most sincerely thank Chair Barron and the Higher Education Committee, um, Member Combo and the Committee for Women, and of course, Chair Rosenthal, for, their op for our opportunity to testify today. If I may be of any further assistance, I hope you will call upon me. And at this time, I'd like to yield to my friend and colleague, Cecilia. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Distinguished members of the Council, Interim Vice Chancellor, Dr. Chris Rosa, uh, student, 
and fellow, fellow campus center directors, um, Cecilia Scott Croft, the executive director of the Early Childhood Center at BMCC, and a member of the Child Care Council at CUNY. At the Child Care Centers at CUNY, I'd like to think that we provide the right amount of pedagogy, student interactions, and quality child care to meet the needs of the students and their children. One of our top priorities is to ensure we work collaboratively across campus and ensure the student parents have all they need to succeed both inside and outside of the classroom. Our program models provide a unique two-generational approach that offers lasting impact for our students and their children. Conversely, our two-generational approach and our program models have a three-fold mission of teaching, research, and service. These efforts support persistence, retention, and graduation. Our programs offer opportunities for student in internships, volunteerism, work-study placement. Secondly, we prepare students for careers in, in the field of early care and education through our collaborative work with the many teacher education departments, and we prom promote research related to children, families, and early childhood education. Our programs have assisted doctoral students at the CUNY Graduate Center with their critical research, we have assisted with service and experiential learning endeavors on campus and promoted men in childcare and numerous leadership initiatives. More importantly, we provide developmentally appropriate early care and education services for children. The information called by our programs indicates that more than two thirds of CUNY child care programs are nationally accredited. Accreditation is the hallmark of a quality child care program. Our programs are licensed by the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene and several others are also licensed by the Office of Children and Family Services. Our CUNY end of the year end of the year report and our student parent survey indicates that our program served more than 126 children in the infant toddler age range, uh, 1,035 preschoolers, 265 school age children. We have, five, we have 11 programs identified as 501c3s, separately incorporated entities, three programs that operate as part of their college associations, one center that is part of the college, and one center that is outsourced by the pri uh, private 501c3. And lastly, City College, which is currently under in construction, hopefully set to open in September, the latest January 2019. This center's child care services will be outsourced by the college. In terms of child care slots, our, our program's licensure ranges in sizes. For example, Baruch College's child care center has one Department of Health permit for 30 preschool children to the largest campus, LaGuardia Early Learning Center, has three permits and a capacity to serve up to 189 children within the infant, toddler, preschool, and school age range. It is important to note that while each program has a sp specific designation of how many children they are allowed to serve within a specific age range at one time, all of our programs have the capacity to serve well beyond our licensure due to the flexible scheduling and the various needs of our students. This allows our programs to potentially maximize services to meet the needs of as many students' parents as possible. The central office at CUNY has numerous internal controls as well as, um, as well as our respective campuses which consistently evaluate our enrollment, external and internal financial controls, fiscal controls. This information is outlined as part of an end of the year report submitted by each campus to the university manager of child care. As part of our Campus Children's Center's blended funding model, we are subject to multiple reporting structures regarding our funding. We must document and justify all of our spending to several reporting structures and in many cases create multiple budgets. For example, one program has an extensive budget which outlines in detail its revenue and expenditures. In addition to this, they must create five to six separate detailed budgets for each of their funding source. 
With additional funding, programs would be able to extend hours, including early drop-off, evening, and weekend services. Additional resources would enable centers to expand capacity by increasing hours and days of services. As indicated by our CUNY Child Care Report, more than 16% of our CUNY students reported that they require child care, and more than 16% indicate they would be unable to a attend classes if child care were not on campus. There is an opportunity for child care service services to build on its capacity in several ways. Many programs have adequate space and could expand hours of services to provide student parents with child care services that are available for a broader range of hours and days. Enabling student parents to have child care that mirrors the time and the days they have classes would give more students flexibility in registering for classes, thereby increasing recruitment, retention, and graduation. Capacities at many centers could be increased with the addition of funding. Presently, 12 of the 16 centers have children on a wait list. For centers that have waiting lists, an increase in funding could provide an opportunity to increase enrollment by opening more classrooms, providing additional hours, as well as days of service. For the more than 1,300 students benefiting from state-licensed, nationally accredited child care programs that offer low-cost, low high-quality child care to our student programs, our programs provide an opportunity for students to experience campus life as well. We provide nominal fees that range from $5 to $50 a week. Since the 1970s, student parents across CUNY and presently 16 CUNY campus children's centers have benefited from this invaluable service. Sprawled across five boroughs, providing various levels of programming, student parents have been able to persist and graduate. As it relates to graduation rates, a recent data analysis from the Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York, indicates student parents who utilize campus children's centers had more than tripled the one-time graduation rate of student parents who did not use the center. Student parents at CUNY Child Care Centers surveyed in 2014 indicated due to an on-campus child care, they were able to take additional classes, increase their study time, participate in group study projects, and, and use on-campus support services. For every dollar a single mom single mother spends on an associate degree, her family gets back $16.45 in increased earnings. For a bachelor's degree, each dollar invested brings her family a return of investment of $8.05. The Institute for Women's Policy Research indicates, in addition to serving as an on as a return on investment, providing childcare also helps to curtail poverty levels. Food insecurity is a national crisis with ever-growing single-stop programs to address students' needs across our campuses. We are attempting to balance the various needs of our students with services available on campus to help them persist and graduate. As it relates to funding, a third of our programs accept ACD vouchers. The current fair market rate delineated by the Office of Children and Family Services indicates child care reimbursable costs for an infant per week as $360 per week, $255 for toddlers, and $220 for preschool children. Child care centers are afforded the opportunity to request, request reimbursement for this rate and utilize these fun this funding structure to create sliding scale fees for our parents. However, we know based on our budgets, the true cost of child care is much higher when we factor all of the variables associated to co in cost. The average cost per child, the true cost of care, is close to $9,000 per child. A most recent cost care analysis of child care done by one CUNY center identifies the true cost of care for 15 preschool children was more than $343,000 a year. 
The research from the Office of Children and Family Services supports the aforementioned. The data published by the Child Care Aware, a hub for child care resources, estimated the cost of child care for one year of full-time center-based child care for children who are infants through age four is roughly $9,247. Another factor that supports this model is the universal pre-kindergarten model, better known as pre-K for all. The re reimbursement rate for centers vary based on the district and identified needs. The Bronx might receive a reimbursement rate of $3,900 for a half-day program um, for a child per year, while lower Manhattan right, might receive $3,400. For a full day reimbursement rate, it might be as high as $10,000 for one child for the year. Once again, these rates do not identify the actual cost of, to programs. Our programs provide placements for students majoring in psychology, nursing, early childhood, accounting, business, liberal arts, to name a few. These placements serve as a benefit to the faculty and support co continued collaborations across campus. Most recent, a recent study by Galt, Millie, and Kurse from the Na Institute of Women's Policy Research indicates that childcare is expensive as well as difficult to access and notably declining on college campuses in recent years. This has been supported by the most recent closures of City College Child Development Center, the CUNY Law Schools space, and Queensboro Community College. For the first, City College shuttered its doors to provide much needed renovations to its center and hopes to open very soon. CUNY Law, CUNY Law School closed and many families are utilizing slots procured at LaGuardia Community College and Queensboro Community College Child Care Center once funded one was one that was funded solely by the administration of children's services and was closed soon after the loss of its ACD funding. Although QBC, BC, uh, Queensboro Community College does not actively have uh, a child care center, the Child Care Council would be happy to assist the CUNY Central and QBCC uh, to, to explore and support the current needs of student parents. Additional funding is needed to support the reopening of City College Child Development Center. When City College closed, its funding was shifted to CUNY's newest on-campus child care center at York, which opened in roughly 20, 2004. Previously, York did not have city or state funding. As we anticipate the reopening of Ch City College Child Development Center, funding is needed to support child care services for city council student parents. As noted by the public advocates report, the report details the need for continued resources to support existing 16 campus-based centers as well as recommendations. This will lead to further persistence, retention, and graduation of our student parents. We are also grateful to the public advocates office uh, that understands as well as supports the need for greater resources and has decided to assist with these endeavors. As we often stated, CUNY Child Care has not received an increase in city funding in more than a decade. In closing, the following recommendations are Campus Children's Centers and our CUNY Research Division must work proactively to invest in a data-driven system that identifies the impact, the benefits, and the values of investing in child care centers. Each campus must invest in increased marketing as well as raising visibility of its child care centers on campus. Abraham Maslow's theory specifically specif specifies a hierarchy of need in um, needs in stage one, food, water, shelter. We must reframe the way in which we view child care on campus. It is not an ancillary service. Child care is not a wraparound service. For service. It is an integral service, it is an integral part of the college, and it is essential to our students' ability to succeed. 
In keeping with this, parents cannot persist in graduating, worrying about their child care, the, worrying about the care needs of their the needs of their children. The benefit and attraction to CUNY for so many of our students is its affordability, location, high quality for student parents. Their children should be afforded the same. In, in the research that truly depicts the number of students on campus with dependent children, invest in the research that truly depicts the number of students on campus with dependent children. Invest efforts to obtain funding, including working to create opportunities for increased funding to ensure programs are able to subsist during a fiscally cha challenging time, writing grants together, and help with seeking out funding collectively. Continue to provide low cost to students. Some students can barely afford a Metro card and food, let alone the cost of childcare. Let's continue to provide support to our most needy families by way of scholarships and emergency funds to make it available to those who truly need care. Standardize the cost of students based upon market rates. Presently, students pay different costs and many families must choose between food and childcare to stay in school. We cannot standardize costs if we lack resources. As we identify programs with low enrollment, let's work to identify ways we can increase enrollment collectively. Pay equity for certified teachers and assistants across CUNY programs. A recent study identifies the disparaging differences in pay among not-for-profit programs and public school teachers with similar credentials. More vocal advocates for public funding, such as child development block grant and child care access means parents in school, and change rather stringent requirements for students to obtain much needed child care subsidies. In addition, increased data will assist campuses with accurately identifying its student population. Additional data collection will also assist our early childhood educators with monitoring children's developed needs. This will further allow us to outline support needed for each campus. This can only lead to greater resources to support existing and future programs and families. The children's centers at CUNY provide invaluable resources to faculty, staff, and parents and could provide more with additional funding and focus. As the largest public institution serving families, we cannot do more with less. In the words of children's advocate Marion Wright Elderman, the question is not whether we can afford to invest in every child, it's whether we can afford not to. Thank you for investing in children and families. Good, mor good morning, my name is Maria Hernandez. I'm a, I'm a proud mother of three beautiful children. My parents are descendants from Mexico. I was born in the borough of Manhattan, and I'm a first generation graduate student. I just completed my studies at Bronx Community College earlier this month. I arrived at Bronx Community College with a nine-year-old, a four-year-old, and a three-year-old. I became a mom at 17. I attended BCC from 2012 to 2013, yet I earned no credits. I received WUs in all, my in all of my classes. I came back in 2016 and I sit before each of you, a proud graduate heading to Lehman College to obtain my undergraduate degree in social worker. My son will take um, part in his graduation ceremony at BCC next week. While he is certainly not finished with his academic endeavors, this is one of the several ceremonies he will experience. I am proud my child is reaching this important milestone at the same time as his mom. I'm proud of my perseverance reaching um, this important milestone um, and the amazing support I received from the entire Bronx Community College Child Care Center. If it weren't for the center, I would have been unable to complete my studies. It was a difficult journey, but well worth it. The program is high quality, affordable, and welcoming. I would have been unable to study, persist, and graduate if I did not have the option of child care on campus. I could not afford a program like the one at BCC without the affordable fees. Once I discovered the program, it just opened up a whole new world for me as well as for my children. It was just amazing. 
The program helped me in so many ways, with my self-esteem, with my children's academic endeavors, obtaining assistance with other services on campus, and importantly, nurturing and supportive environment for my children. I could not have done it without the Early Childhood Center at BCC. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak about the benefits of campus child care. I am a living testimony camp uh, I am a living testimony campus child care is a powerful tool for children and families. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. And uh, we're going to begin questions, but I do want to acknowledge that we have been, rec have been joined by Councilmember Lander, who was here and had to leave. We have Councilmember Cumbo, Councilmember Rodriguez is here. That's it? Okay. So we're, we're going to get to them also as they have questions. But we want to first thank you for your testimony, and we want to now explore with you how we can use this data that you've given us to make sure that we are moving forward uh, to the best interest of all of us who are using these services and know how important they are. So I did have a whole list of questions, but I want to start with City College and its child care center. What's the delay? Uh, and the cost that's here, was this a cost that we knew at the outset was going to be brought also to opening this? So, uh, in terms, I'm going to yield to my colleague, Keisha, regarding the, the particulars, but uh, we fully expect uh, the, the child care center to open during the fall. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we work That's closely. That's disheartening to hear, because one year is now turning into three and a half years or two and a half years or whatever the math is. And I heard in testimony, we hope to open in September, but maybe not, mm -hmm. maybe in February. So that's very distressing. So I want to start first with City College and find out what's the problem. Uh, Council, Council Member yes. Barron, if I can um, offer out something. Um, so for example, and certainly City College's closing is not, um, cannot be compared to events such as 9-11. But I know that um, at Borough of Manhattan Community College, when we began our renovations of two classrooms and expanded. Can you hold on to that? I want to deal with City College. Yes, 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 ma'am. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 I'm getting to that. I'm just saying that renovations, with respect to renovations, um, there can be a lot of twists and turns that take place in terms of renovations. And I know that- Is that what happened at City College? I would, I would say that there are a number of variables, and one of them is certainly that re renovations take time. I do know because I have been working very proactively with the Vice President of Student Affairs um, there, as well as the University Manager of Child Care, and we have been proactively reaching out to City College to support them with respect to questions uh, regarding uh, the actual space, the curricula, um, services, funding, applying for the Department of Health permit. And in terms of like uh, September, maybe um, Jan January. So let's say, for example, most um, child care programs are required to have a director on, on um, staff uh, six months before your opening. Mm -hmm. So City College is currently working on its RFP to um, identify a program that it will be outsourcing its childcare to. In addition to that, there are multiple um, things that they have to do to procure the license. So um, it would be- With all due respect, I, I would hope that that was known at the outset. So again, my question is what is the delay. You indicated renovations. I would like to know specifically, in addition to renovations, what has delayed it to this point? If you were planning to open in September, you should have already put out the RFP for the director so that in September, the person, you should have had it before. If you wanted it to open in September, it should have been that the director would have been in place since March if you needed it six months in advance. If you know that timetable, what has been the problem? 
and if it's been renovations, whatever else. I'm really not pleased at all, particularly with City College, because when I came in, I raised the question, and I haven't gotten what I have found to be follow-up to a degree that's acceptable. So with respect to your question, yes. I, would, I would say, ma'am, that there are a number of variables. Some of them have been fiscal. Some of them have been the fact that the long-term director retired. So in her, in her retiring, there, is, there has been no representation with respect to child care on campus at City College. Mm -hmm. uh, the vice president of Student Affairs at City College has been working very proactively and has been reaching out and trying to take care of a number of these outstanding issues. And, um, and I can understand the frustration because certainly um, that means that students aren't afforded an opportunity to have childcare. Um, but I know that they are working um, very um, proactively and they're working as expeditiously as possible to deal with all of the variables. And, and, I, and I can, um, I would like to say on record further that if there, are, there continues to be any concerns or challenges that as a member of the Child Care Council at CUNY, um, I, will, I will provide as much support as possible to my, to my sister program. Uh, City College, I'm, I'm a proud graduate of City College. My, um, my bachelor's, my master's, and my second graduate degree. So um, I really uh, hold City College near and dear to my heart. And uh, we, I know that um, uh, Keisha has also been working very proactively to ensure that we can do as much as possible because we know that this is well long overdue. In terms of the financing, um, in your testimony, I can't find it right now, but you made reference to the fact that there's an additional cost which had not been initially factored in. Was that what a part of your testimony was? So typically what, what takes place is, is that um, we have a pot of right. It's a paragraph that says additionally funding is needed to support the reopening of City College Child Care Center. When the college closed, its funding was shifted to CUNY's newest on-campus child care center at York. Previously, York did not receive. As anticipated, the reopening of the City College Child Development Center funding is needed to support child care services for City College student parents. So I'd like to understand better. Okay. So typically what, what occurs is, is that we have, we have a pot that is given, us, given to us to the state, right? And um, it's designated for a specific amount at that particular time, it's designated for that particular amount of campus children's centers. You receive funding yes. based on the number of centers? Yes, okay. so the number of centers. So let's say if we had, through our child development block grant, um, one point, and I'm just gonna put out a number there. Let's say we receive $1.2 million to be allocated to that currently 16, um, 16 child care centers. Yes. So we currently have 16 child care centers, but with City College coming on board, then we would have 17. So then that would mean that we would have to split the pot differently. Is the pot split equitably by the number of children at each center or by the number of centers, the number of sites? So we typically, in terms of the number of centers and the sites, there are, ver there are several factors that um, are taken into consideration with respect to the funding, and certainly it's licensure, it's the, um, it's the type of children that you're serving, it's the number of hours that you're providing care, it's, there are a number of variables. It's just not um, just, okay, across the board, 17 centers. There are, ver there are several factors that go into our funding model. So is it equitable based on the number or the types of services that the children get? So that if a center has three children in one category and another center has 10, one center would get uh, the funding for 10 as opposed to three? It's, it's based on the, um, the variables of the different programs where um, the right, cost so of care. So based on the variables, is it equitable? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now, um, 
instead of dividing it by 16, we're going to have to divide it by 17 in yes. terms of the cents? Okay. Okay. Um, the, you say that you're a member of the Child Care Council at, Medgar, at uh, BMCC? At CUNY. At CUNY. At CUNY. We meet monthly. How many members are there in the total body? We have 16 centers. We have 16. And who, are you the person then that coordinates it? You're the coordinator current, or the chair? The, or the current chair of the Child Care Council at CUNY is Ms. Janet McIntosh from Mecca Evers College. And, and the past chair is Lorraine Mondestair from Baruch. I'm the treasurer. You're the, okay. Oh, you're the best person that we need right here. <laughs> okay. So I have another question. As you've heard, uh, the city council has greatly increased its funding to the campus child care centers. What are your plans for this additional money to be utilized? I saw something here, something about administration, something, 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 and we certainly know we need administrators, but we want to make sure that this, we maximize the impact of these dollars that it goes to providing direct services and increasing the number of students. I understand your limitations based on space, right. but what are your plans for these additional dollars? Right. And again, um, we are so grateful for the investment. Uh, first of all, because of the affirmation of the importance yes. of childcare. Um, but we think this will provide a, a direct boost to access and expanding capacity. And um, as my colleague mentioned in her testimony, we would leverage those funds in order to expand capacity within our existing licensing capacity by expanding hours um, at when, when the center is open, thereby enabling us to serve more student parents and their children. Um, and we would also use the funds to allow campuses to invest more in their staffs to make uh, CUNY campus child care more competitive in an increasingly competitive marketplace for talented early childhood educators. So that would be the primary uh, use of those funds. And we would ensure that they were distributed equitably through a, a rational funding methodology that we alluded to earlier to ensure that uh, resources are developed uh, based on need, on, on, on need across the campuses. And in, in the testimony, it referred to a study that was done in 2014, the student parent survey. Is that the last study that was done? In, that 14, the most in 14 and 15. We have a data group now working on. Okay, when did that data group uh, get established and how long have they been working? Uh, they got it, it was established earlier this spring. That's not good. We've had hearings, we know the topic is important, and to just have started it this spring perhaps doesn't give us the most, the best opportunities to get in touch with students. We know they're busy, they may not always get it. When is the survey, when is the, how is the data going to be corrected? Is it a part of uh, registration or how will students know that, right. that there is a survey and that they should be encouraged to participate? Sure. Uh, the data group uh, is, is working now and that involves both strategic work in terms of determining um, what the scope of the analysis would be. But it also involves uh, refining the survey that exists, uh, that, that has already been designed. And I'll defer to Cecilia in terms of the data collection, but it's, it's done by the center directors and staff in the child care centers themselves. So they always have access to, um, to, stu to par student parents who are surveyed. It, it's really a matter of us really coming together and taking a look at, at how, because as, as in terms of our status as 501c3s and our reporting structures, we certainly have to report out a lot with respect to our programs and uh, how we're utilizing the funding as well as how many families that we're serving. So um, Putting together the data group, it's more or less coming together with those child care directors and identifying ways to answer the, the, um, the most appropriate questions, a mix of qual you know, qualitative and quantitative questions to more or less get the information that's required. And, 
Just so then is this data that you're collecting from parents, student parents that are presently using your services? Correct. How do we find out in the larger campus what other students might need these services? How do we find out, how do we cast a wider net to let other students know that these services are available? At our last testimony, one of the students said she didn't know that CUNY even had the opportunity. So how do we get the word out? How do we tweet and all of those social media to let students know how do we use the handbook? I don't know if it's a handbook anymore that lets students know what the services are that are available. Well, it's probably a mix of variables, and, and I know a lot of our campuses work very closely with our public relations as well as our public affairs offices. We've updated a lot of us have, you know, antiquated like Facebook pages. A lot of us have Facebook pages. We're on Twitter. Um, the central office helps us a lot with visibility in terms of identifying um, and we've been working to, we know that we have to create more visibility with respect to students knowing where we are and what services that we have available. So I just would um, think that um, looking to um, increase our um, social media as well as our, um, our, our pages, our website pages, and just, um, and just being more visible on campus. What single instrument or document or entity exists that for a surety we know every CUNY student has a contact and knows that uh, there's information there that every student gets. What is that one platform or that one that every student in CUNY is exposed to? Well, we have Whether or not they read it is another issue. We can get to that. But what is that one? We have a student handbook and our services are listed. I would, I would say our services are listed in our student, uh, our student handbooks. And I don't mean the student handbook that's provided by the Early Childhood Center. I mean the student uh, handbooks that are provided by students um, when they come for the semester. But I, I hear, I, hear I, I like and hear where you're going. It's harder now we, where we don't rely on paper as yes, much right. to say that there's the one thing that everybody gets, but uh, we are working on prominently featuring uh, campus child care resources on all of our student affairs web pages, certainly on our, on our student affairs page. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate very much it's, it's a great idea. We have the ability to um, send email blasts to uh, existing students to, to their college emails to ra and we do it uh, about other important student affairs issues and based on your suggestion chair baron we we would commit to sending uh, uh prior to the beginning of the semester of the fall semester just an email blast about alerting people to the resources that are available on their campuses regarding campus child care so we thank you for that suggestion that's something that we can absolutely do Okay, I have lots more questions, but I'm going to turn now to my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, great, so thank you so much, Chair Barron, for getting the ball rolling. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. So great to see you here. And I want to start by saying I really appreciate everyone's um, concern for these child care centers and the desire to have them going for students um, and get more going. I also want to start by congratulating um, Ms. Hernandez on your graduation um, and your child's graduation. I, what a special thing to be celebrating together. Thank you for coming today and sharing your support about, you know, and letting us know about the value of these child care centers. Your validation of them is what gives us the passion to continue t this hearing and continue to follow on with this topic to make sure every student has access to childcare and have the success like you had. So 
I appreciate your being here. Um, my questions are all follow-up to the chair's questions, and they're just some things that came to mind as she was talking about them. Um, and I'd like to, they're mainly clean up any confusion that seems to be going on. Um, I always start with funding, so I'm gonna jump right into the weeds about something. You mentioned that the state allocates something like $320. It depended on the type of child care, 320, 225, 220, whatever it was, per student. Is that per week or per year? So let's say, for example, uh, I'm a program that is receiving um, city council funding, hypothetically. And um, so I would, so then in, in terms of my budget, and let's say I'm, I'm uh, asking for $200,000 for hypothetically then I would, I would, um, so then someone would say to me, what is, what, is your, what is your market rate? What is the maximum that you could charge, right? So the Office of Children and Family Services provide market rates every year for us for child care. So we would be, that is the reimbursable rate that we would receive. Mm -hmm. And so because we would be eligible for those reimbursable reimbursable rates, the student parents would pay the sliding scale fee out of pocket. And so that would In be monthly. In other words, your total fee is above, your total cost is, is above. above that that yes. the state reimburses. Correct. But can we just start with what the state reimburses? So the state reimbursement rate for, so for an infant is $360 per, per week? week. Okay. And Correct. how many weeks in a year? So I mean that they would get, would it be per semester? When you, what's the comparable to the true cost is $9,000 yes. per child per year. How many weeks is in that per year? So when we're talking about weeks per year, we would be talking about, let's say a semester is two semesters. It would be uh, fall, spring, and summer semesters. And that's where the true cost is yes, $9,000. Correct. correct. Sorry, could you just break that into weeks? I don't know how long you are. So, okay, fall. so we're like 15, we're 15 weeks for the fall, we're 15 weeks for the spring, 30. and eight for weeks. summer. Eight, eight, eight to 10. Eight to 10. Sorry? Eight to 10, ten. weeks for summer. So we're at 30, say 40 weeks? Okay, so quick mental math, yes. right, is, I am just terrible at mental math. Hang on. Oh, my staff to the rescue. Is 14,400? Am I wrong? 14,000 is the reimbursement you're getting from the state for a cost of 9,000. No. Tell me I did the math wrong. No, no, we're not getting reimbursed at 14,000. We're getting reimbursed at the current market rate that's provided by the Office of Children and Family Services. I'm just doing the math. 360. Oh, yes. No, we're not getting, when I say that 300, okay, um, let me clarify. The three, when you're saying $343,000, are you referring to the $343,000? I'm just saying, if you get $360 per child. No, not everyone, week. okay, so not everyone is getting the $360 per child because not everyone is serving infants. Of not course, everyone is serving obviously. Toddlers. Right, and not but every. I'm, so let's use the lowest number, 220. So 220 times 40 equals 8,800. See, I'm not seeing how the math doesn't, where I'm going on this is, okay. it strikes me that possibly the cost is covered by the state per child. And so in thinking about well, if the state is going to cover the cost, 
then really the only thing holding us back should be facilities. If we had enough facili as many facilities as we have and as much demand as we have, we can fill, we can fill. So if you had, right, let's think. If you have, you're saying you have 16 programs, 17 coming this fall, then you serve, and you serve, what, 1,600 children, 1,400, whatever the number is. So what's your wait list? Is each, right, the obvious questions are, you need to lay out for us each facility, which by the way, we come up to 25, not 16, so there must be an on-campus, off-campus component or something else is going on there and we can run through our list with you, but why aren't you walking into this hearing with a sheet of paper that says, here are our facilities, Here's how many kids they serve, each one. Here's the wait list for each one. Here's the state reimbursement we get for each one. Here's the cost for each one. Here's how we make up the difference with grants, city funds, whatever. And here's where we are today. I mean, do you have that? information we I, I imagine that we could compile it I mean it's a is very there somebody one. who oversees all the child care centers is there someone with that responsibility Th that would be me I work along a conjunction with the um, child care council and um, I have I the city state and federal grants funnels through my office and but each individual campus receives their, they receive additional funding for um, their program, and it's a different amount. Each program requires a different amount to run their program. I um, do you have ha a chart with the information that I just asked for? I don't have all of that information. I, we did um, provide the um, operating budget to the finance office here. How many clinics do you have? We have 16 centers. Then what's, I'm gonna go through my list and help me understand what's the difference between mine and yours. Okay. Mine starts with Baruch College. Do you have that one? We have Baruch College, yes. Do you have Brooklyn College? Yes. Do you have College of Staten Island? Yes. Do you have CUNY Graduate Center? Yes. CUNY Graduate School of Journalism? No, I don't have anything in the that The Graduate one. Center serves the what? journalism. The CUNY Graduate Center serves students, parents from the journalism school. Um, hang on, I literally just didn't hear what you said. But hang on one second. I'm gonna hold back on that question for a second. Um, so can you tell me for the College of Staten Island, say, looks to me from the information that you gave to our staff <coughs> that the total budget is 1.5 million. Mm -hmm. Is that what you have? The CSI? I don't have their budget with me. I have a state allocation of 266000 mm -hmm. Looks like you have 111 kids there. Yes. Some 18 infant. Could somebody be doing the math? 18 infant toddlers, 75 preschool. Just, Sean, can you do the math for me? Sorry. Yeah, I'll tell you out loud. Ready? 111 kids. Uh, sorry, 18 infants. Yes. So that's 18 times 360 times 40. And then they have 75 preschool, and the reimbursement for that is 220. Yeah, and then 28 school age, does that mean they get UPK or what does the 28 school age get reimbursed at? I don't, I don't have that number as far as reimbursement. 
school age? Yeah. That's after that? school? Yes. Okay, so let's school. not include those because we're just looking at the child toddler piece for one second. Am I, are you saying thank you so much? Are you saying that for after school you get zero reimbursement from no, the it's state? A, it's, no, it's a, it's, a different, it's a different rate of reimbursement. So it's you know low, the rate of it's reimbursement? It's lower than the uh, reimbursement rate for preschool. So I would say it's in the ballpark of 180. 180, but let, okay, but Sean. May I, may I just say for one second that in terms of the reimbursement rates that's uh, given by um, OCFS, then there are, there are certainly eligibility requirements with respect to that and that we have, and we have a specific amount that we are reimbursed mm -hmm. by OCFS. So it, it doesn't mean that because we have that many children mm -hmm. that, we are, that we receive that much Okay, that that's all right, that's normal. So okay. tell me, can you tell me of the 111 for the 18 infant toddler, 75 preschool and 28 school age, how many are eligible for reimbursement? Well, that's very, that's very specific to each particular campus. Yes, it is, but this is the job of the administrator. I, I mean, I worked at OMB for seven years. If you had asked me those questions about the programs I looked at, that's pretty, you know, elementary information. I don't have that information, and I can work towards getting that information. Okay, I'm going to assume 100% for one second. Mm -hmm. So, Sean, 28 school age. At a, thank you so much. So that comes to roughly $919,000 um, if 100% were eligible, right? To your point that not everyone's eligible. And the cost of the program is $1.5 million. So I don't know what goes into that. No, but we you know, it just, I, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like I have enough information to really have a, a knowledgeable hearing. How, how quickly will it be for you to get together this information so we can know, right? Because these are just basic. You, do you oversee this in yeah, Keisha? Yeah. So you look at this information, right? We, uh, I'm the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, so it definitely is in my, I, I have responsibility for it. So, and I, 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 see, I, I, I see the model that you're sketching, so, mm. and I appreciate it. And for lack, I, and I'm not, I'm not uh, I, I don't have the acumen that you have in this area. But it's a general ledger, in, in essence. Yeah, exactly. It's simple CFO stuff. Yes, so sir. sort of what's the cost? What reimbursement are you getting? Why? Right. Like, I don't know yet whether or not you're maximizing reimbursement. Are you? I don't know. Are, do you check? I mean, the fact you should know what, how many of the students are eligible or not for all these three different, four, three or four different categories of student. That's part of your ledger. And then, so you, you need to know the eligibility, and then you need to know that you're drawing down. Perfect example, the New York City uh, Department of Education, there's a lot of Medicaid eligibility, a lot of students who are medically eligible, but the DOE doesn't check for that when they provide OT and PT services, so the city is just simply losing out on revenue. We're perfectly supposed to get any other city in New York gets this money. So it's hard for me to understand what your fiscal situation is. So maybe we should set that aside until you understand the numbers better. Please. Um, the reimbursement rate comes from one pot of money, which is the federal block grant. Okay. We also receive money from the city, the state, CUNY and some of the campuses. The reimbursement is only one portion of that. I, we do have information and data on that part of the block grant because it runs out of another office centrally um, and that we can get that information and we do have that information. As far as the, uh, the other components to the city and the state um, funding, that we will have to go back and generate 
what that looks like, but I do have Look, not I with don't me. do your job, so I don't know what the component parts are. That's your job to figure out. So yes. you understand what I'm looking for, yes. the financial ledger. Yes. Let's move on. Um, of the 16 centers, how many have students on a wait list? And what's the size of the wait list? We have about 12 centers that have wait lists. I don't have the number for each center, but we do have 12 that have wait lists. And, it, and, just, and Cecilia and Keisha can weigh in more richly, but the, the wait lists, as you would imagine, are not just general wait lists. They're wait lists for particular programs. And, and so there are some, there are some uh, programs and license for certain programs where uh, there's, there's a significant wait list and somewhere there's still capacity. So um, One of the things that was, there's capacity but you're not taking people in off the wait list or there's no capacity? Where, where we're actively outreaching to, to You have capacity to and people right. are not coming. Well, or, to, or where we start to run down, like I, in my testimony I referred to the, the order of priority where we start to run down the order of priority in order to, to make sure that the slots are able to be utilized. Okay, so I'm really not following. Sure. I think we, it would, again, it would be really helpful to come to a hearing like this with um, a chart like that. So again, this is not a fiscal ledger, but a, a wait list ledger, I guess, where you would have you know, each facility, and I guess you have three different columns. One is, for your three different sets of people you look at, right? Full-time, part-time, and then faculty and staff, whatever they are. So I guess we would need to know in order to understand what's going on here, the, the answers to that. Okay. So are you saying that you've run through all three of the different categories and at some of your facilities, you don't know which ones, but at some of them, there, you've gone through all three categories and still there's capacity. Did you want to weigh in experientially? Yes, so like for example, um, uh, let's take my campus for example. We have um, a capacity to serve more uh, children who are in the UPRK program. And so uh, we have historically had some challenges with respect to filling all of our UPRK slots. Where do you have UPK programs? I'm sorry? Wh which campuses have UPK programs? So we have several program campuses that have UPRK programs, uh, BMCC, BCC, um, Bronx, uh, Bronx Community, Borough Manhattan Community, we have UPRK at Hostos, uh, we have UPRK at LaGuardia Community College. So we have uh, UPRK programs on several of our campuses. And all of them have capacity? In terms of UPRK slots? Uh-huh. We know that that's one of the areas that's a little more challenging for our campus centers. And that's because a lot of So the all of them have capacity. Do you know about how many slots each one has? So when you say, when you're saying capacity and you're saying slots. Vacancies. Uh, okay. That's fine, because for us, um, okay, so vacancies. So it might vary based on the campus. But That's I know right. for us that you pre -K, if I were to speak in, in general terms with respect to the camp, to the, the council, a lot of our UPRK programs, that's where we typically have, a lot of our UPRK programs are where we typically have slots. Infant toddler programs fill up rather quickly. So that's um, another chart that I think would be really helpful for the council to have in an oversight hearing is to understand where you have capacity, you know, vacancies by, by campus and how many, um, you know, with, you know, and, and it's also troubling, again, if you're having a problem with um, funding your entire program or, or wanting to open up your program to all the people on your wait list, um, you know, that UPK money is easy money to get. All you have to do is fill it. And I know that in my district, I mean, I don't know what you have in my, on the Upper West Side, but we're dying for UPK seats. We have, we, we, we have too many kids and not enough slots. So 
But the issue is not acquiring the UPK money. Many of us- Correct. Uh, the issue is not acquiring the money. The issue is more, so um, if I could create a, a little bit of a picture. So at, at let's say BMCC hypothetically, right? So we serve, we're serving, like most of the CUNY uh, campus child care centers, we're serving children who are coming in from lots of different boroughs. So at BMCC, you have 27,000 27, students, right? So we have a half day new pre-K program, right? And we have stayed with a half day new pre-K model simply because we've, uh, for full day, our parents don't stay. They have other commitments in addition to Good. having other commitments. Some parents are like they want, they may want to have a program that's closer to home because they have other children and they have other people who can pick up those children. So historically, when we look at our data with respect to our UPK programs, our numbers have always been lower than let's say um, our, pre um, our other classrooms like our, our toddler classrooms or our three-year-old classrooms. So again, getting back to sort of a fiscal, you know, sort of chart, you know, if you're getting paid per child, yes, you want correct. as many children in there to cover your costs. Sometimes you can, you know, money can be fungible if you're being underfunded for one program, you know. But I mean, it sounds like you just need to do your homework on this stuff. I mean, if you're gonna, if, if we're gonna be able to figure out what's going on. Do we have any other questions from, yep, sorry, uh, or Chair, um, Council Member Holden. Um, I, I heard that the College of Staten Island has an infant program. Yes. What, how many programs do we have for infants? Because I'm looking at the New York City College of Technology, City Tech. Yes. They, they don't, don't have. have. No, they don't have. Why? Well, they don't have um, an infant program. They used to have an infant program several years ago. But for um, the new requirements um, and the new regulatory guidelines for um, established by the Department of Buildings for infant toddler programming, they had to close their infant toddler program. They had to close their infant program. Because of the physical space wasn't adequate? Is well, the physical space in terms of uh, what was required by the Department of Buildings, we used to receive a, a waiver at times if we had a space that was before a certain time and uh, City College was, uh, City College, excuse me, the College of uh, uh, City Tech was unable to receive that and so they ultimately had to close their infant program. Which would seem to me, right, right now they have a new building. Um, that that if that was planned properly, they'd be opening up an infant center. I mean, because I, that's I, I taught there for forty years, yes. and I had students who had to drop out, and and uh, or sometimes I would watch the infants in my office while the student went to class. I mean, this is this is what it, would, it came down to, and that was a big obstacle. Childcare. Um, many times they could, uh, students couldn't get in because there wasn't enough space. And you, and you mentioned, I think, in, in, in a bunch of testimonies that space was a problem. Is it physical space or is it just the, the, the number of children that they can, um, I guess it's both actually, right? Yes, yeah. because I think, like, for example, I, and I can only defer to this, but, like, we have 27,000 students, right? So we have a license of that we, we have a license for 92 preschoolers and we have a license for 17 school age children, right? But we maximize that. So that's 109 children, but we maximize that. And let's say we serve 150 to 170 children per, per semester. Per, uh, semester. We still would be unable to serve the true need of, of the college. And so for some, space is, is an issue and for some, um, uh, getting additional space to expand uh, is sometimes a concern. And certainly like um, uh, a new building probably wouldn't be, unless that's something that was originally um, planned, a new building wouldn't necessarily be earmarked for like the child care program. Well, but, but I, I think it should be because being on the, on the front lines for yes. so many years, it was a huge problem. Okay. Uh, just my own story, I when I, I had my first child when I was at Queens College. There was no child care, obviously. We, yeah. I would have to take my son to school and many times walk out of the classroom 
and this was in the 70s, obviously, there was no, uh, there was no child care, but, but it's such a huge problem now, and we have children throughout the, in the college, throughout the floor, in the classrooms sometimes, and you, have, you can't turn a student away with a child, um, and, and, but it's unfortunate that we're not offering, and, and I know it's, it's a matter of licensing, it seems complicated, but I don't know if it should be that complicated, if it's well thought out and planned and, and a priority in the university. Um, I don't think it, it is at this point, just and with the city actually not, I, I, I know you said that funding hasn't increased in 10 years in the city's part until now, um, which that, again, is very puzzling since we have a great need out there and education is important. We certainly should offer, uni I mean, this should be uh, on all the campuses childcare and it should all be the same. You shouldn't have, you know, infant care on one campus and not on the other. I mean, I know that it's, but that's, where, that's our goal. That should be a goal where we just have all the campuses have the same care and we cover all ages and certainly infant is very, very important for our city tech. Yeah. And I guess for every campus. So I think that, and I'll try to work, and I think we all should work with the university to try to get to that goal. And we need some kind of master plan here of how do we get to that, and how much money do we need, and where do we have to go for it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just have a few more questions, and then we'll move to other council members. On CUNY's website, uh, it, it indicates that uh, there are 2,400 children that are served. In your testimony here today, the numbers add to 1,426. So can you account for that discrepancy? Is it an old number on the website, or how can we resolve those differences? We apologize. That must be an old, an old number on the website. It. OK. And are there any UPK slots at senior colleges? The ones that you listed that I made note of were all community colleges. Uh, Are there any at senior colleges? Um, CSI. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, Could you speak into the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Well, um, the College of Staten Island. Okay. Um, Brooklyn College. Um, Lehman. Yes. Okay. And City Tech. And City Tech. Okay. I hadn't heard them listed, so thank you. And are all the UPK slots half-day slots throughout? No, full day. Full no day. they're full-day. They're full-day. They have full-day programs. Oh. I thought I heard you say that they I, were half-day. I have a half-day program. Oh, you have a half-day. Yes. So it's we have a half-day program because okay. that is our need. And all of yours are half-day. Um, all of our half, all of our slots for you pre are half-day. Okay. But at those programs, we're the only program that has a half-day. The because of you, yes. Okay. And the other question that I have is um, getting back to whether or not we're meeting the need, do you know how many students applied for child care ser services and how many uh, were accepted? Did you fill all your slots based on the different programs? But how many students applied throughout? And those that did not receive a placement were they waitlisted? Do you know if they went someplace else or found other services? Do you have any way of knowing what happened afterwards? Um, I know currently I don't have how many applied, but I know that the students who, um, the caps that do not have services, they are, um, we rec refer them to either utilize somebody other CUNY campuses that might have eligibility based on the, the CUNY policy where it allows for you to serve your students first in your campus, matriculated, non-matriculated, and then faculty, staff, and the community. For those campuses that don't have the availability, we encourage them to, you know, utilize another CUNY campus that might have a availability. Are non-matriculated students eligible to apply for child care? Non-matriculated? Yes. And are students in uh, CUNY start and ASAP, they can all apply? Yes. Okay. All right. Council Member Rodriguez, do you have questions? I have more, but I want to thank you. my colleagues. Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you to both, uh, Chair. I want to focus on the quality of the program. As a former teacher and a father of two daughters, and living in a city that we have the most segregated educational system in the whole nation, as someone that has weakness that today, when you walk in the cafeteria, 
at City College. The faces of the students today are not the same as in the 1980s when I was there. That was more than 80% black and Latino. And today population, even though the black and Latino population continue growing in our city, being 29% Latinos, 27% black, senior college population, the number is going down big time. And a lot got to do with the pipeline. And the pipeline has to start in the program that you provide. And that's why for me, I don't look at, I don't refer to them as, yes, a children, neither as a child care, I just see as a student. Because that's where the re-education begins. My wife always challenged me when I say, I taught for 13 years high school, and she said, you don't know about teaching. Yes, the early child education, that's where you build the basis. Like if you are a strong, if you start in ninth grade and be the 90 other students, that happened because when you were elementary, kindergarten, and middle school, you already built those bases. So one of my questions is, first of all, what percentage of those students today are black and Latino, or the student that you have in your program? That are, that are presently served by yes. campus child care? Present right now and ready to start in the next school year in September. Uh, I, we, we would have to try to get the, the data for you. I mean, um, I, I think experientially, Cecilia yes, can our speak programs, to Our programs mirror the diversity of the college. Can we say that the vast majority of the students there are black and Latino, they're not? Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. They're not? I would So what percentage? I, I couldn't um, give you a percentage because, again, the programs, the, chil the children that attend the programs mirror the diversity of the college, and I would say. So the student, the student that go to your program. Yes. They reflect the diversity of the campus. Yes. Therefore, if the program is a city college. Yes. The student population that we have in your program reflect today the faces the color of the skin that we have today compared to the 1980s. So when the 1980s, the city college population was more than 80% black and Latino, and today is less than 70%, we are saying that we also see that reality when it came to the children who attend your program. Correct. Okay, but just want to, Paris, you know, because yes. I, I know about, you know, I'm having my view for New York City for all. Yes. So yes. I'm for, you know, our, these Cervantes, New Yorkers, black, white, Asian, and Latino, Asian, for me, it's not just about just advocating for the black and Latino, but there's a big problem that we have today on lack of diversity in the senior colleges. And that only will happen. I'm not blaming presidents of Hunter City College. This is about what is the pipeline that we are building. And I feel that in the program that you run, we have this great opportunity also to build that pipeline. And what is the ratio of teachers per student that you have today? Um, I would say it's one to three. And what, it's one to three because we typically have on staff uh, a head teacher, an assistant teacher, and some capacity uh, part-time su part support. So in a typical classroom, yes, how many correct. students will, you see, will we see? So a typical classroom, it would depend on the age range. So like for, um, let's say an infant classroom, an infant classroom by Department of Health and New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Standards, you can have up to eight children. You can over enroll. Let's look at the third, a, a three years old. Okay, so a three year old classroom, you can have up to 16 children. So if I mean, you had 16 children in a three year old classroom, and, and what about services, specialists on reading, writing, math, psychologists? So, I'm sorry? What about all additional services provided in those centers related to psychologists, specialists in math, reading, so that they can do the one-on-one -on -one work with those kids that they need more help? 
Well, typically we have a lot of services on campus that support, so like we have a lot of clubs. But are you but asking do, if do, we have- Do you have those data that you can share with all that we can say here, let's say at the City College Center, we have this number of students, the ratio of a student per, per student is this number, and we have this other additional, and be able to share those data with us. So you're talking about, when you're talking about numbers of students who are accessing this service, or are you talking about our programming specifically? Do we have programs that focus on math, reading? No, the 25, let's think about a classroom that we have 25 students. Yes. And for correct. me, students are children. Okay. That's what I refer to. Yes. We have the 25 students. We student don't have 25 children in any class. How many do we have? We don't have any 25 children in any class. What is the max? I, I just throw the number. What is the number, typical number? For the, typical, the typical number is anywhere between, I would say, the 14 and maximum 18 range. Because UPK only allows you to have a maximum of 23 students in a classroom. But we, we know within our programs to continue to have the quality that we like to have in our programs, we, we, are making, we are ensuring that we have enough staff to child ratios that are adequate. So and everything, so for an infant toddler classroom, you can have a maximum of eight. For let's say a two year old classroom, you can have a different maximum. You might have a maximum. And at three 10. years old? And for a three year old classroom, it could be 15. And but the 15? Three year old, it might be three year old, three point something. You can have a different age. I get it. And at three years old, let's say we have 15. Yes. We have a head teacher. Yes. And we have an assistant, assistant teacher. teacher. You would have, let's say, a part time aide. Okay. Right? And, so that would be three paid staff. And then you might have a student intern. Do, do you keep track, do you know, let's say, where, which college the those students who attended the program in 2002 are attending today? No, they do not know. We, we don't. I think that that's important, though, know, for our purpose. Because for me, this is about where do they go? Okay. Right. I mean, like, and, and it take me for, and I think that we need to challenge ourselves. We need to leave legacy. And as someone, again, co-founder to a school, teacher for 13 years, sometimes we need to push the envelope, all of us, okay. or put in resources because, we, I mean, for me, myself, my wife who is on education, it's about what is our expectation. And public or private charter or not charter is about are we taking those kids to the best schools, middle, high school, and colleges. So I think it will be good data for us to look, for we to look at it. If we can able to say, those children who started with us in 2002, this is the middle school, elementary school that they went. Okay. This is the junior high school that they went. This is the high school that they went. How many of them were we able to place in Stuyvesant, in Hunter Elementary? How many of those kids who started with us, they are going to school in the Upper West Side? Because this fight against segregation involves all of us. Because we know that we have same school districts, but the students who live in particular zip code, they only stay in the area where they are born and raised. And even though we share the same school district, we have the cases in many areas especially when the black and Latino children, even though we try to do the best we can, but who are opening door? Who are working with those kids in your center to be sure that they, we are building these bridges, that after we leave the center, they should, only, they should not only stay in the school where they live, they should be able to be supported to have choices. So with that, my, that question is related to that. Which school, do we feel that we can do better to also place those children in more, and all the schools are good? I'm not saying, you know, it's all about, you know, our heart and investing and expectation. That's the general description, but we also know that there's a particular number of schools that is difficult to get in. So who are you working with to be sure that parents and students they are supporting to be prepared to apply to the best schools 
after they finish your program? Well, I think that that boils down to creating collaborations and supporting like um, some of our programs. We have open houses, uh, let's say programs like uh, Harlem Children's Zone, Success Academy, or some charter schools that are interested in, uh, in uh, recruiting some of our children. Um, but I think it really focuses or boils down to um, the particular program and a particular program's model and their focus. And while I think certainly there's an appreciation and we want to ensure that children are, um, are uh, w well equipped similar to our UP, uh, our UP pre-K focus, are well equipped to enter public schools and private schools and different, um, uh, different uh, school settings. Um, it really boils down to the focus of the particular I, I, I just feel my, and I finish with this, I just hope that we can think outside the box. Yes. You know, when, when I was at City College in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and we took over the campus, we fought very hard to to maintain the daycares open there. Mm -hmm. Because we also were dealing with the possibility to be closed. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not only just to keep them open. Yeah. For me, this is about where are we taking those children? Because it's not about here, we collaborate with this number of institutions. For me, it's about there are institutions in our city that they get resources, they raise money, private and public, to work with those centers and be sure that they are teachers and st students and parents. They are supported and they work together so that first of all, they start as a toddler, that they take the GNT. Because the rich family, they are preparing the kids to take the GNT. They pay to those psychologists to take the tests. And my thing is about how can we work? Because you are, you know, I'm here because of CUNY. I came old, I came at the age of 18. But now we're raising the older generation of our children. They still, we are leaving them behind. And if we prepare them better, then we can be able to say, not only at the college level, CUNY is the one that opening the door to us, but CUNY is also able to say, we are also preparing those kids that they are better material to apply to Hunter, to apply to City College, because we have two tier of colleges today in a senior college. So I just hope that we know that we can continue from our end to continue putting out our support to you guys, but for you also to think about, yes, what institution can we bring as partner? What are we taking those kids? Let's challenge ourselves. If our kids, they are successful, if they become a president in the future, everyone wants to take a photo with that kid. But if the kid doesn't fail, and they are not placed in the best school, no one's taking credit teacher, elect politician, or whoever. So I just invite you to, you know, to be able to look at those data and see how we can use those data Point to one. plan better for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. I have a few questions, and then uh, my colleague has questions, and then we're gonna speed up because we have a deadline that we have to be out of here because another committee is coming behind us. So just very quickly, are there any off-campus childcare center locations? Any child care services offered that are not located on a campus? No. Family child care network. Uh, BMCC has what's called a family child care network, and we work with several homes within the five boroughs to provide. We don't have an infant toddler structure, so for those students who come to us and require infant toddler care, uh, our program matches them with a. Um, with a family child care provider that supports them in that way and we and we cover that cost. So how many locations is that? You said you have a network. So, so. we have a network of homes that w the parents can choose from. So like how many are in the network? In our, within our network, we have about 10 homes. I'm sorry? We have 10 homes. 10? Yes. So there are 10 homes yes. that have met your standards and your qualifications. Correct. And we have someone who goes out and ensures that they are in compliance, and those programs are licensed through the Office of Children and Family Services. Are there other schools that have that same arrangement? The network? No. No, I think the last network that was... Um, so BMCC is the only one? That has a family child care network. Okay, good. 
And then um, Queens College. Uh, our childcare services at Queensborough Community College offered through a Head Start program as opposed to a child care center, and if so, why? So the program at que Queens, Queensboro? Queensboro. Queensboro. Queensboro is closed. The services used to be offered, um, they, were, they, were, they were offered from, um, they were outsourced by um, a nonprofit organization. That particular organization was funded solely through ACD funding and once the structuring of the, um, of the ACD funding took place a few years ago with Early Learn, they were not awarded an Early Learn contract, so they, went, they were unable to stay open. So, but at that particular time, they were a Head Start structure. Okay, in your testimony, which I can't put my hand on right now, you talked about, oh, I think this is it, the coming back to the City College, yes. Child care program? Yes. Did you there say that it was going to be outsourced? That, that has been my communication. Oh, okay, here it is, I see it. Yes, that has been my uh, communication. Yes, they are looking One at center is outsourced by private yeah. 501c3. Yes. And lastly, City College, which is currently under construction, set to open in September, the latest January. Yes. The, this center's child care services will be outsourced by the college. Could you explain that? Yes. So um, the Lehman College structure is also outsourced by a, a, a separate corp. There's a corporation that comes in and runs their child care program, and it's been around for more than 20 to 30 years. And I know that City College has been working. Um, uh, that's why they're Acquire, require, that's why they're putting together the RFP because their child care uh, structure will be outsourced by a company. So basically they're going to um, uh, have an organization that's a 501c3 um, run its child care program. And they may have some oversight by way of uh, someone at City College, but the program itself will be outsourced. They no longer have a board of directors. Is it only Lehman and City College that are outsourced? Correct. Okay. Um, thought I had another question. Oh, how can we get the data as to the ethnicity of the staff at each of the child care centers? I read your testimony and talked about being culturally sensitive, and how do we have, can we get the data as to the ethnicity of the staffing at each of the child care centers? We, we would have to do a survey. Uh, mm -hmm. They're hired uh, through different funding sources, as you know, so, but that's something we can compile. Okay, that would be very helpful. And uh, my colleague, Chair Rosenthal, has questions. Got that, thank you very much, Chair Barron. Um, I guess uh, I just want to put a little bit of a caution on the six, I want to understand the city funds a little bit better. Um, according to our cobbling together of how much city funds there are, we get to about a million dollars. I could tell you the amount by center that we have. Do you, do you come to the same total current? Without the uh, incoming 600,000, we get to about 1,060,000. Yes, um, the city provides 500,000, and CUNY matches that currently. So that's where it comes to the million. I see. And then, yes. Okay, got it. Um, and then is that match equal split half and half for each of the, I think it's five colleges that the city covers? Yeah, it's, it, it's, we apply the funding formula to that as well, to those funds as well. Okay, so the city and CUNY split Hostos, Kingsboro, LaGuardia, LaGuardia, um, I have two Kingsboro more. LaGuardia. France Community, BMCC, right. yes. BMC okay, host, so they host, split the two. Host, yes. And then of the 600, will CUNY match that as well? Uh, I, 
I mean, I, I defer to my colleague who manages our funding formula, but our understanding was that we developed this rational funding methodology that took into account, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of variables in terms of addressing unmet need, and that the fairest way to allocate the additional six hundred thousand dollars would be by processing it through the funding methodology. So it. That, that's our plan. You know, I don't understand that. Does that mean you will match in the same way that the current formula has a match of CUNY funds to city funds, 500,000 each, roughly, if the city's going to pony up another 600,000, will the formula similarly come up with a match for additional Sit CUNY funds of 600,000. Uh, I, I guess we need to speak to our finance office about that, but right now we were, we were intending that those funds would add to our overall capacity to fund all, all of the, the child care centers, not, not just the community colleges where the match is in play. You might want to think strategically about that. you know, and think about where the need is, where you can leverage the money to get the most. Is there demand for services at those five colleges? Is there a wait list? Is there a wait list for after school? You know, I think that'll help you once you have that, which gets back to council member Holden's set of questions. Sounds like you need to have a holistic approach that you don't quite have right now, but a holistic understanding of how you're spending the money, why you're spending the money, where the wait list is, how you're getting reimbursement, where you could leverage money to get more reimbursement to meet demand. I don't think those basic questions are being asked. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how you could even answer the question of how you would spend the 600 because you don't have information that would guide you to answer that question. And then it strikes me that you should be mindful of the fact that the 600,000 is a one shot, right? It's for fiscal year 19. We don't know what the funding will be in fiscal year 2020. I don't know if you'll be advocating for that to be included so that the city's 500 becomes 1.1 million on an ongoing basis. I don't know if you guys are thinking about that. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm curious when you're looking at the demand and you can get us that information, according to the public advocates report, um, the, uh, the highest level of unmet demand, right? Is that in the infant, toddler, after school? What, I forget now what the public advocate is saying, that it's childcare. Yeah, so if it, so she seems to have information knowing where the greatest wait list is. So you guys will look at that as well, so you'll know where the most dire need is in order to spend that money. Um, yeah, all right? Thank you. Okay, those are all my questions today. Thank you so much. Uh, we want to thank the panel for coming, and uh, I, in closing, I just want to make sure that uh, I extend my congratulations also to Ms. Hernandez on your great accomplishments and your son's. I, it's a stepping up ceremony that he's going to be at. Yes, yeah, I'll be graduating from the GCC pre-K program, pre -K. and I have another three-year-old who's also there. So she'll be moving up to pre-K program, but since I'm graduating, up. like she does, she can be there, stay there. As long Parallel as well. graduations, Thank very you. good. Congratulations! Glad that you stuck with it. Uh, I know students when they get those WUs, it's very difficult. Yes, to get I, those. actually, um, I when I came back, um, 
I was put in probation, so yes. I was only able to take two classes per semester, and I was I, able to write so many appeals for financial aid and TAP, and I had to show them that really, hey, now I'm on commitment, you know, everything's right. working out. So it took me a long way. Yes. And it was really, really hard for a I committee to, you. you know, take the appeal and accept it and all that stuff. I commend you. It's not an easy task to overcome those WUs that not, stick on not. your transcript, but I commend you for that. And finally, in closing, and I think it comes also to what my colleague talked about, the public advocate talks about the 16 child care centers that are really very, that operate very independently in terms of the licensing, staffing, procurement, particularly also. And uh, this decentralized system has significant cost ineffectiveness when it comes to uh, many of the staff benefits and other procurement kinds of issues. And I wanted to know uh, what is CUNY's position on a more centralized coordination and oversight of what, as a public advocate has indicated, is a very diffuse system. So is there any attempt or uh, interest on CUNY's part to look at how it can be more centralized and how it, that, in effect, would be more cost effective? I, I think the point is very well taken about analytically the, our ability to understand the dimensions of our network of child care centers in all their complexity mm -hmm. to better leverage uh, economies of scale to, right. uh, and things like procurement. On the other hand, uh, I think our centers themselves value their independence, in, independence in the sense that they're situated in unique campus structures with unique constellation of resources that they could leverage. So I'm not quite sure that a, a one size fits all uh, would necessarily be the way to go. But I think the point is extraordinarily well taken that there are opportunities there. Not and, a one-size-fits-all because that, as you said, doesn't address the unique needs of each campus, but a person in CUNY who can perhaps uh, assist in how you want to benefit from the economies of scale and make it more cost-effective in certain areas. It may not be in all areas, different programs because the populations that are each of these campuses that are at each of these campuses is very unique and very different. But we've got to be able to perhaps find a way to save money in procurement. Sure. Perhaps we can all use a particular uh, vendor to make sure that uh, we can get some benefits in that regard. Mm -hmm. Just one quick and a quick follow up to that. In just thinking about you know the system as a whole, looking at whether or not you have pay parity by title. Right at the different institutions, I think at the different child care centers, I think that would be valuable to know. I mean, some, and some students might want to know that, you know, like, like Ms. Hernandez, oh, if I go into this program, I'm more likely to get child care as opposed to going into this other program where it's going to be harder to access. You know, if you had a centralized sort of o oversight, I agree with the council member, not that one size fits all at all, but just uh, someone at CUNY who had a, a good understanding and could communicate what's going on, um, I think that would be really important. Thank you. We want thank to thank you for coming, for sharing your testimony, for subjecting yourselves to our questions and our inquiries, and we know that we'll be able to get responses to those things that require follow-up. We look forward to that, and I certainly look forward to being invited to the ribbon cutting for City College when they have their opening of their child care center. We want to thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. You are uh, released, and we're going to call our next panel, and we have, again, to be mindful of the time. We have to be out of here. Yep. Okay. And we have two panel participants. I think it's Tasha Lee from Nyperg and Emily Skydal from Nyperg.
Council will uh, administer the oath. Hi, would you mind raising your right hands? <laughs> you too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. yes. Great. Please state your names for the record. Sure. Um, my name is Emily Skydell. I'm Latasha Lee. Thank you. You may begin. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for, um, for having this, holding this hearing. My name is Emily Skydell. I'm the Higher Education Coordinator for NYPERG. Um, I, you'll be seeing a copy of the testimony which has um, Tasha's testimony paraphrased in it, so you have both copies. Um, so uh, in an incre degree completion for student parents is vital. Um, in increasingly economically divided and high cost city, college degree completion is the surest way to gain economic security. Um, in New York City, 20 of the 25 fastest growing occupations that pay over 50,000 per year require a college degree. Um, despite that obvious benefit, um, too many New Yorkers are still without a degree. The U.S. Census Bureau calculated that a mere 19% of Bronx residents over the age of 25 hold a college degree, um, a bachelor's degree or higher between 2011 and 2015. Um, and the problem can be even more severe for student parents. According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, just 8% of single mothers who enroll in college graduate with an associate or bachelor's degree within six years, compared with 49% of women students who are not mothers. Um, and while the average cost of private childcare or daycare in New York City can be prohibitively expensive, 25,000 a year, um, enrolling a child in daycare at CUNY can cost as little as $5 a day. Um, it's unsurprising that access to affordable childcare increases degree completion. A study by Monroe Community College in Rochester found that student parents that use the childcare center there were 30% more likely to stay in school. Um, and CUNY's child care centers can be a unique and powerful tool for socioeconomic mobility in New York City, um, while as of 2015, fewer than half of two-year and four-year colleges nationwide had child care centers. Nearly every CUNY campus has one. Um, Alexis Ramos, a student parent that benefits from the child care center at BMCC, shared her story with us. Uh, I'm majoring in a political science and theater, aim to be a senator or mayor. Um, I'm just going to paraphrase through it. She started college right after getting her GED. Um, when, when I started looking into schools, I was worried I couldn't afford it. A huge obstacle was figure out, figuring out where my two-year-old son would go while I was in school. Um, my only option was to look for daycare. Prices were way too expensive. I felt I would be drowning in debt. Um, I was able to enroll in BMCC since it had childcare. Um, concerningly, we've learned from some students that they were unaware that CUNY has childcare services available. Um, you know, single mothers with only a high school diploma are over three times as likely to live in poverty as single mothers with a bachelor's degree. Um, Melissa Estrella took 10 years to get her associate's degree simply due to the fact that she was unaware of childcare at BCC. Um, so CUNY got, CUNY's child care centers must be well supported and promoted. Um, we thank the city council for helping to increase funding for child care. Um, and truly we thank you for this doubling of child care. It's something that, um, it, this over doubling of child care, it's something we couldn't have even um, predicted. It was just such a welcome surprise and it's going to have such a, a huge impact on students. Um, and you know, we see this as a huge intervention strategy to curb student dropout rates. We, can, we recommend continuing this expansion. Um, I, I'm certain that, uh, that it'll, 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 turn, it'll turn into um, a lot of new students having access to it, even if we haven't fleshed out the numbers yet. Um, as this community, but um, you know, we also recommend that the City Council Higher Ed Committee strategizes with advocates, parents, CUNY administrators, and other stakeholders to determine effective outreach and promotion strategies as you're expanding funding. We want to make sure that students and community members across the city know about this service um, so that they can benefit and, and go to school and graduate. Thank you. My name is Latasha Lee. I'm a student at BCC. Bronx Community College, where I've been elected the Officer of Legal and Legislative Affairs for our Student Government Association. I've also been involved with NYPERG, where I'm able to advocate for students just like me. I'm 25, and I'm a parent of two children. My first child, I had my first child when I was 21. I'm from New York, but I moved to North Carolina for a bit during high school. 
When you're a parent, you, real, you realize how important survival is, and for me, that meant getting an education. But I didn't end up going back, and, back to school until I was 24, when my children were of school age. I worked in sales at a clothing store making minimum wage. The cost of raising a child is really expensive. I was living with my former partner where we were splitting expenses. After we broke up, I moved in with my grandmother. If I didn't have my grandmother, I may have felt inclined to stay in an unhealthy relationship, as so many women do. My father lives in North Carolina, and he's like my only resource. I realized that I needed to go back to school to be able to live on my own and be independent, but I didn't think I could afford it. I didn't know too much about financial aid, and I knew I didn't want to go down the path of student loans. I didn't know that there was childcare at CUNY. I waited three years after becoming a mom before going back to school. My dad has luckily been able to help me from North Carolina with rent and food, but I understand that a lot of people don't get that support. He's also been able to help with daycare before I enrolled in school, but at the time he wasn't helping me with other expenses because they began to pile up. I'm a full-time student at BCC and I'm also a part of the ASAP program. All of my college expenses are covered through ASAP and financial aid, and I no longer need childcare because I waited to go back to school when my children were of school age. However, if I were working full time and taking evening students, I'd, I'd have the options of putting them in BCC's child care center, so that's a plus. There are so many expenses, expenses involved in committing to being a student. I've been lucky to get support for some aspects of my living expenses but it took me a long time to get here. Imagine if I knew about the child care center at CUNY sooner. If I had known, I could have been in school much sooner. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy balance. CUNY is marketed as an engine of opportunity. So many families and single parents ac across the city so desperately need this resource. What potential students and future leaders are we leaving behind? Child care is an obvious priority, which is why I'm thankful for the increase in funding. However, this information has to be made more accessible. It's a very valuable resource. It's a very valuable resource. With better promotion, we'll be able to increase student enrollment at CUNY. All over the city, there are parents fighting to provide a way to care for their children. It's extremely difficult to raise a child on minimum wage. I believe higher education is the way to end the cycle. Parents need to know that higher education is an option. CUNY does a great job of moving people from the middle class, of moving people to the middle class than any other university system. But by, by neglecting to promote this resource, this childcare, outside of our campuses, we're leaving behind a crucial part of the population. And it, an increase in funding is an amazing first start, but it is a first start. Parents need to know about this resource. Thank you so much for your testimony. It's uh, always most impactful when the persons who are the recipients of the programs are able to come and to share their testimony with us. And I heard you say that you didn't know about it had you known about the childcare campus programs you could have applied sooner. Do you have any suggestions? I've always tried to ask CUNY about how they do their outreach, how, do, how does the word get out, because I've heard it more than once that people didn't know that there was an opportunity to use the child care services. Do you have any suggestions that we can share with CUNY as to how every person going into CUNY, crossing its thresholds, will know of this opportunity that exists to at least apply to see if they can get in. Do you have any ideas? Either one of you, both so of you? I see CUNY promoting um, themselves all over, like the subway system and everywhere, basically. So I feel like if they were to incorporate that they do have childcare into those same like mm. um, um, advertisements, then it would be really effective. Do you have a, a question? Do you have any ideas? No, I think I think that's a great idea. I think um, in the high schools, um, in the financial aid centers, um, I think 
I think students go to the financial aid department maybe first as their source for um, information, um, even more so than advisors. The advisement gap is so is so wide at CUNY. It's like 600 students to every advisor. Um, so I think just making it um, making that information available in multiple departments across CUNY, um, also like any kind of local community centers or social places where people go for social services to know that um, that child care exists at CUNY. Do you have, I'm sure that as with large institutions, they pay corporations, PR organizations, blah, blah, blah. I think that if CUNY launched an initiative amongst its student body mm -hmm. and had some type of contest for students to devise posters and to be able to share that information, I think that that would be a big draw because CUNY does a great job with educating students, but to me, most of the advertisement is kind of stayed and dated and you know, it doesn't really pop and get you. So do you think that that might be something that the student body would be interested in uh, De participating? Definitely. Um, I think I think it would be helpful. I think you you brought up really good questions around like wait lists because I know that I've heard of about wait lists at ASAP too. So I wonder sometimes if if like there isn't enough capacity to take in the amount of students that actually would benefit from these programs. Um, if the outreach was really 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 done in a thorough way, I think a lot of students need these programs. Um, then then we even have capacity at at CUNY to absorb. So that's, that's always my one, my one thought, like maybe um, there's a reason that it's kind of, that programs are a little hard to find. <laughs> Did you attend high school in New York City? Uh, I went to Nourishal High School, so north of the city. Did you? Um, I went to high school in North Carolina. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I went to high school in North Carolina. From where? North Carolina. North Carolina, okay, yeah. good. So. That doesn't apply. Okay, I'm going to turn uh, over to my colleague. I'm good. Thank you, you good? both. Okay, good. Thank you so Thank much you so for much. coming and sharing. And seeing no other testimony, no other persons wishing to offer testimony, we're going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you all so much for coming and for staying. <laughs>